Lots of people take prescription painkillers like these to deal with acute pain. But abuse of these opioids is killing Nebraskans. We'll talk about that next on Speaking of Nebraska. Welcome to Speaking of Nebraska. I'm Mike Tobias. Each week through early June, we'll be here to talk about important issues. We'll also look at what's happening in state government and share a bit of Nebraska history. The words crisis and epidemic are often used to describe the abuse of opioid prescription painkillers in Nebraska. Here are a few numbers from Nebraska Health and Human Services and the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Almost 150 Nebraskans died of drug overdoses in 2015. The most recent year statistics are available. At least a third of these were opioid-related, and opioid-related deaths have increased slightly in the last decade. Nationally, drug overdose was the leading cause of accidental deaths. More than 20,000 of the overdose deaths were related to prescription painkillers. Well, let's talk more about opioid abuse with Nebraska Attorney General Doug Peterson and John Massey, who's a Lincoln Pain physician. Thank you both for being here today. Yeah. First of all, as we talked a little bit earlier, those numbers maybe, in your mind, don't accurately reflect the scope of the problem here in Nebraska. Correct. Um, many times uh, we feel that people have problems with uh, overdosing or uh, with these medications, and it's not apparent uh, based on the studies that are done afterwards. So we think they might be underrepresented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's true. What I hear from law enforcement is the number of uh, autopsies, the number of coroner calls they have are going up, and you don't see a spike in auto fatalities or homicides, and the explanation uh, seems to tend towards drug overdose, and we suspect most of those are opioid. Yeah, and we also know there's a, a trend upward. We're seeing some of that. Pretty significant. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's go back and talk about what exactly an opioid painkiller is. You know, what are some of the more commonly prescribed ones? Um, you know, in general, it's something that, you know, I've had them. You get them if you get a surgery, right? Correct. Opioids have been around for 5,000 years. They're derivatives of poppy, and they're all either similar to morphine or synthetic analogs of morphine. They're very effective for acute pain treatment, and uh, they are something that the world has been familiar with using for many years. And right now they're a majority of what is prescribed for this level of pain, correct? Yes, um, probably in the 1990s is when that began. Uh, pain as the fifth vital sign is something that came out. Physicians were aware that we needed to treat pain and we knew that opioids were very useful for acute pain and so we began utilizing them in increasing frequency for chronic pain situations as well. So when did the abuse problem start? When, when did we start seeing this here in Nebraska? Well, you know, I think the history I understand and John just referenced is that in the 90s, doctors were now being told as a fifth vital sign, you really had to address this. The pharmaceutical companies came in with the opiate uh, drugs. And I, I would think throughout the 2000, 2010 period, uh, you were seeing doctors prescribe a lot of uh, pills uh, for get conditions such as knee surgery. Uh, other problems because they were under the gun to properly manage pain. Uh, and I also think that there was some confusion would be the best way to say it, misrepresentation by an industry potentially as to the addictive, potential addictive effects. They, they underrepresented uh, how addictive this could be based upon some old studies. The fact of the matter that addiction rate number was much higher. And what you did, and, you know, a lot of people think about heroin and the heroin epidemic and they think of skid row type of uh, conditions. The fact of the matter is when you have across the board economic classes, age groups of people being prescribed pain relief, all of a sudden now you have far more of an opiate based drug out in the mm -hmm. community and inevitably with that you're going to have the addictions. The number of prescriptions from I believe 1999 to 2008 increased by 400%. And then from 2008 until now, probably an equivalent amount or very similar. So 
what you have is many, many more people being prescribed these medications. I think data says that 200 million prescriptions for opioids were prescribed in the United States, which has 350 million people. And another number I like to think about is 98% of the world's supply of hydrocodone is consumed in the United States. And I think I saw a number that, um, based on the number of prescriptions, there's enough. there were enough prescribed in, in a fairly recent year for every American mm -hmm. to have a full bottle of these around their house. Correct. Now, the problem is a lot of, you know, a decent number are being used for the purpose that they're supposed to be used, but then you've got a lot left over, correct? Correct. I mean, I can say for myself, I had a knee surgery and uh, I was provided uh, hydrocodone afterwards. Another common one is oxycodone and vicodone. I defer to John on all the different types. But for me, I think I was given 60 tablets. And uh, we had personally seen one of our good friends, their son, go through an oxycotton addiction. And so I was pretty uh, sensitive to the fact that this is dangerous. But I was, I was somewhat struck by the fact that, you know, after I was done with my treatment, I had a pill bo uh, bottle sitting in my cabinet of another 40-some pills. And uh, not having a very good awareness, but for what we'd seen our friends go through, not having awareness of really how dangerous that is. Yeah. I think I'd seen a, a statistic from HHS nationally that, in, at least in Nebraska, that 12 to 17,000 Nebraskans are believed to either have an opioid dependence or be opioid abusers um, using the, the drug in the, in the wrong manner. You know, for those folks that are in that situation, and you've seen some of this, give sure. me an example of how that dependence, how that abuse plays out, what that's like for that person. I think it's probably important to realize that people don't set out to fall into this problem, of course. People um, have a risk associated with the likelihood of developing this problem that's largely genetic. And there's a lot of different numbers out there, but somewhere between 12 and 24 percent of people who start with the medication for fully legitimate purposes are at risk of developing a problem with these medications going forward if we aren't careful. And what happens then is that people start taking these medications which are very effective in an acute post-operative case right. and they continue then as the disease changes and you don't have a, an acute injury, you develop a chronic pain situation which is neurologically different. So these medications lose their effectiveness and we make probably a very big error when we continue to try to get relief from these medications when they're not going to be as successful. So people take more and more of these medications until they develop a problem. And you were talking earlier just about how, you know, when you go off it, you get some pain back and, and how, as a doctor, do you know whether that's part of the addiction, part of the problem? Is it real pain? Well, pain's always real, we would say, but what we would say is that many times Chronic pain is opioid resistant, but the disease process of the substance use disorder makes a patient feel that when they are not having the medication in their bloodstream, their pain increases. That's the way the body is enticing them to continue to use the agent, much like somebody who's smoking cigarettes desires to have that nicotine back in their system. They don't really need it, but the body is telling them to get that. And it does that by saying, I hurt. And if you can get them away from those medications, then very often they'll be more comfortable off of these medications. Yeah. John Massey, as a, as a pain physician here in Lincoln, you, you deal with a lot of this. Um, it doesn't always lead to death. We know that, the opioid addiction. But it, there are a long list of health con conditions that this does contribute to, from things like depression to uh, pneumonia. Talk a little bit about that. Well. They, CDC would tell us that 91 Americans die daily from this and of each day a thousand people are in the emergency room with complications from this. Opioids lead to a decrease in breathing. The body doesn't breathe and therefore these people become somnolent and ultimately uh, can die from this. But if they don't get to that stage, this um, lack of consciousness can lead to things like aspiration, which leads to pneumonia, which can be problematic, and it can al also, this overall process, can lead to problems with depression, anxiety, and suicidality, and so forth as well. So, Attorney General Peterson, we, were, we talked a little bit about some of what you're hearing from the law enforcement community, um, but it is starting to become something that, that is being seen in the, in the criminal justice system. 
Yeah, it is. I, I think the typical digression that you see is typically uh, someone may be prescribed a drug for an appropriate basis. The doctor eventually says that oh, we're going to cut this prescription off. It's served its purpose. If the addiction develops, they're going to start to look for ways to shop around to try to get it from a prescription method. Eventually, if that gets completely cut off, and we've just put into effect this year the prescription drug monitoring program for that very reason, then typically what happens is that pushes them into the street market. They're looking for people who are actually selling old prescriptions or other drugs, and, and our biggest concern from a law enforcement perspective is we can look at other states and see how this digression has worked. Uh, and once they are cut off from the prescription, the, the appropriate method of getting the drug from their physician, then they just go to the street. What we're seeing in the street is not only heroin, uh, not only manufactured uh, Oxycontin by, out of uh, drug mills out of people's homes and basements uh, with pill presses, but the other thing that's very concerning is now on a national basis we're seeing fentanyl, which is a synthetic opiate, come in with the street drug of heroin and it's laced in with the drug and people are taking dosage levels of fentanyl, which can be a thousand times morphine strength uh, and having serious overdoses. So from a law enforcement perspective, it's become very concerning because although the, the dependence started from a medical perspective, it soon becomes a street drug perspective. Um, and our primary focus is trying to both educate from a prevention standpoint and then also prosecute suppliers. Talk a little bit about the pre prescription drug monitoring program since you brought it up. It's new this year, just started in January in Nebraska, and we were kind of one of the last states to, to adopt this. Yeah, we really were. We were uh, Nebraska and Missouri were the final two states that didn't have a rigorous uh, prescription drug monitoring program. In fact, that's how uh, Dr. Massey and I got to know each other <laughs> is because uh, when I got into office and because what we'd seen from our own friends' experience, we... Um, we started talking to the Nebraska Medical Association, the Pharmacy Association, the Medical Hospital Association, and said, what can we do to start networking this? Senator Howard had already started some legislation, and I think it, we just kind of brought this coalition together. And uh, it, finally, the legislation was passed in 2016, went into effect in January 2017. And it's, it's certainly better than what we had, and we, I think everyone understands we have to kind of fine-tune it. But our concern from a law enforcement standpoint is if we become very effective in that, then we're going to stop the prescription abuse, uh, arguably reduce it significantly. But uh, if the person still has the dependency, then they'll go out to the street. Is it, is it too early in the process to talk about results and what you've seen so far in the first few months? I, I believe so. It, it takes some time, and, and the drug monitoring program is one data point that clinicians can use to help them understand what medications patients are taking. Um, but certainly there are many other uh, ways that we can curtail this problem. Yeah. Are, are these opioids overprescribed by physicians? Well, I think, I think they may be, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, I, I'm a pain physician. I want to make sure that people understand we want to treat pain, and that's a big problem as well. I think if there's a missing education point with the healthcare provider community is that these medications are potentially less effective than we have been led to believe or we have felt in the past. And so I think that's part of the problem. They're also cheap and they're easy to administer and some of the things that are more beneficial, less risky, are sometimes harder to get to for patients. Yeah. You wrote in a, in a Nebraska Medical Association publication recently, pain treatment and avoidance of prescription opioid abuse are not mutually competing goals. Um, are you talking about there being other solutions out there? Well, absolutely. I want, I want people to have successful treatment for pain. Um, under the best of circumstances, in chronic pain situations, opioids may reduce pain by as little as 30% or less and we need to do a better job than that. So if we're just focusing on this and running into problems, we're missing the opportunity to help people. Yeah. So what are the other solutions? One of the things that we, uh, I've tried to do uh, from a law enforcement standpoint is to talk to other attorney generals, the Ohio attorney general, the New Hampshire attorney general, the Wisconsin attorney general, and say, what, can, what have you found successful, what has not been successful? And all of them now are in a fairly serious crisis situation, but they suggested uh, developing the network with the medical community, um, also just the community care uh, field, health and human services, 
to develop some type of both prevention program, law enforcement program, and a treatment program. Right. So back in October, we had a, a symposium at the University Med Center, and uh, now we have, from that symposium back in October, have developed some task force groups working in prevention, and we've started the uh, public service announcements in that regard. That's the dose of reality. That's the program. dose of reality, which was gifted to us, in effect, from the uh, Wisconsin Attorney General's mm -hmm. Office. Uh, law enforcement, we're trying to get together and be both uh, networked very well with the federal authorities, but also talking to some of these other law enforcement agencies in Ohio, for example, and say, what are some of the effective methods, the use of Narcan and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And then treatment. Treatment, I think, is one of the biggest challenges, but I, we just recently had one of the task force meet at the Med Center uh, last month, and I was very encouraged to see what the treatment looked like. Very encouraged to know that in the medical community. Now at the med centers, they're looking at curriculum, dental schools, pharmacy schools, how to, how to make young doctors, young dentists uh, aware of how to better address uh, the prescribing of these drugs. And I know John and other doctors are meeting to create better standards uh, for the doctors here in Nebraska. So I think we're trying to do the best we can, both in prevention, treatment, and in the law enforcement standpoint. But, uh, you know, there's no way to say that we've arrived. I think we're just getting this thing going and trying to be in front of it and to avoid a crisis in Nebraska. That's our ultimate goal. Kind of a philosophical shift in, in the way physicians are looking at pain management? I think so. Uh, new data comes online every day, helps us fine tune our understanding of the risk and benefit ratio of these medications. And also I think uh, more in-depth understanding of this disease process of pain and what good things are to help people in a more sustainable and less risky way. Yeah. Obviously a controversial solution, but there's some studies out there that would say medical marijuana is one option. Is it? I, I don't believe so. I think, um, I think that data is not out there that says this is a problem, that uh, as a solution to this problem, we might just be bringing on our next problem. There are certainly people who have that uh, opinion, and I think their challenge is that they don't have data to support that. Yeah, I would say to that, Mike, that I think that comes from the industry and the advocates for marijuana. That doesn't come from the medical community. And it's troublesome that they kind of manipulate because they do uh, isolated uh, anecdotal stories, uh, and I don't think that's good medical evidence. So we were, uh, as we were kind of getting ready to, to do this show, talking with a number of, of the folks that are involved in this production and, and you know, many like myself said, you know what, I've got some of those around, or yeah, I have some of those from a surgery a few years ago or whatever. So if somebody has some of these, what should they be doing with them? Well, we have uh, drug take back days, uh, but I really think the easiest thing to do is people can go to their cabinets whenever they watch this program, and they can take those drugs, they can go down to their pharmacist, the pharmacist will have an envelope available, and throw it in the envelope and it's mailed to a special designated by the FDA location and DEA, where they'll be just disposed of. And that's really important because one of the things we see is as this addiction gets cut off by the the, either the prescribers or from the physician, what they'll start doing is people will look to raid cabinets of friends, family members, and that's where a lot of young people get their drugs. Right. And so it's very important that you not take it lightly and don't think maybe I'll use it the next time I you know, turn my ankle. Get it into the uh, pharmacy and get it disposed of. Yeah. There was even a, a trend in recent years of teens having parties with these things. You know, they were farm or skittle parties. Mm -hmm. Is that still so, happening? I'm afraid it is. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many incidents have occurred. Uh, that's one of the things why we're doing the Dose of Reality Prevention Program, because we want young people to completely understand that just because it's in a brown bottle, don't ever be fooled to think that it's not harmful. And uh, when I go out and speak to high schools, it's one of the things I talk about is if anyone's lying to you and indicating that it's, it's not harmful or dangerous, they're, they're, they're definitely misinforming you. Because fairly high, go ahead. As a clinician, I, I see all the time where somebody comes to me for the first time with a problem of pain and they're already able to get these medications from a friend or a well-meaning relative and I think that's very problematic because they just don't understand the risk that putting themselves under. And, and it is a, a significant problem, maybe even on a percentage basis, and more so for, for younger Absolutely. people. Absolutely, and th these, these medications aren't safe, and you don't know in advance, unless you're very carefully looking, who's at risk of developing a 
a severe problem or a lifelong addiction. Yeah. So about 30 seconds left, final thoughts, what do you want people to know? Well, I think all Nebraskans to know that talk to your doctor when uh, anytime you're looking at being prescribed these opiate-based drugs about how can we be as cautious as possible. Also, for young people to understand that this is really dangerous. Don't even think about uh, messing around with experimenting with pharmaceutical drugs. They can be very deadly. Um, and just, I, I guess I am encouraged as the medical community in Nebraska is becoming more and more um, advanced in looking how best to control the flow of pharmaceutical uh, opiate drugs. Have meaningful and direct communication with your providers. We want to treat pain and we can do so successfully without unnecessary risk. We just need open and honest communication. Okay, good words to end on. Dr. John Massey, Attorney General Doug Peterson, thank you both for joining us. Well, let's take a look at some of the other things NET News is working on. Ben Bohall told us about maker spaces and how this growing trend has caught the attention of Nebraska educators and entrepreneurs. Brandon McDermott from our partner station KVNO told us how an Omaha couple is living with HIV. And coming up next week, Grant Gerlach reports on livestock industry regulations issued by President Obama but put on hold by President Trump. Grant talks with producers who have different opinions on the impact. You can listen to or read all of our signature stories at netnebraska.org news and connect with NET News and our journalists on Facebook and Twitter. Lots of money talk in the legislature this week, tense times for senators debating tax cuts at the same time as they're trying to balance the state's budget in light of reduced revenue projections. Here's what Senators Sue Crawford and Jim Smith had to say about the tax cut proposal. People who see me, um... they're very concerned that we would be passing a policy now um, to cut taxes at the same year that we are facing these tough cuts um, to our programs that serve our families and concerns about the impacts of those cuts um, on education, tuition costs, health care costs, daycare costs for those families. If we don't do something, we're going to be facing this same situation year after year after year. Our path forward is to grow our state's economy. Our path forward is to diversify our employment base to grow businesses inside of our state, yes, and attract businesses from outside of our state, but keep our people here. If we don't do this, we're going to continue to face these budget woes. Well, it's been an interesting week for our state government reporter, Fred Knapp. Uh, let's start with talking about that uh, failed tax cut package. Right. Well, uh, as you saw, there was opposition from uh, Democrats like Senator Crawford, and also uh, moderate Republicans on the basis that it would starve government <coughs> from being able to afford needed programs. But there was also resistance from more rural Republican senators who said it was too heavily weighted towards income tax cuts and they're not getting a whole lot, a lot of income out there right now and not enough on the property tax side. This was a, a big loss for Governor Pete Ricketts and some strong words from him after the vote. Right. Uh, he uh, said that uh, 27 senators had stood up for Nebraska taxpayers and, you know, 22 by implication were against them. Um, and interestingly, uh, there were four uh, Republican senators who are up for re-election either next year or in two years mm -hmm. uh, who uh, the governor has shown that he doesn't have hesitation to go against incumbents of his own party three uh, that he did not endorse and lost last year, and uh, who knows whether that could happen again. So we may see some political implications on down the road as, as things play out. And then on to the budget debate that truly dominated most of the rest of the week. The, the main budget bill did advance, uh, but not before a rather heated debate that essentially focused on Planned Parenthood and family planning. Right. Uh, it's a very small portion of the, of the budget, and as a matter of fact, all of the funds that were being discussed were federal funds, but the question is, who gets them? Right. And one of the uh, current uh, recipients is Planned Parenthood, not for abortions, but for contraception and pap smears and other reproductive health services. But uh, people who are opposed to that organization because of abortion tried to say, well, the state should prioritize these other types of organizations. And uh, that produced a huge fight and it, uh, Eventually, it was taken out, the language, 
on the grounds that um, it shouldn't be part of the budget discussion. So with the budget that has advanced, it still doesn't quite make up all that is needed to be covered in terms of, of reductions, but there also there was kind of an interesting uh, technique that was used to, uh, to do the math there. Talk a little bit about that. Right. The way they closed the gap was uh, to lower the reserve requirement, which I would liken to the minimum balance in your checking account. They lowered it from 3% to 2.5%, and that's worth $43 million right there. Um, this is different from the cash reserve, which is the, your savings account. Right. That's going down. It was at $637 million at the beginning of the fiscal year. It's going to be go down to $379 million by uh, the end of the current budget, which is about four and a half weeks worth of spending, whereas there's a rule of thumb that you want eight. Right. And that's something, again, the governor was not terribly happy about. No. He said that the uh, senators ought to uh, buckle down and, and do more cuts. And he provided them a, a list, but it wasn't very popular. It was things like water projects and uh, the University of Nebraska, how much gets paid to Medicaid providers in nursing homes to care for folks. and. Uh, those were pretty, pretty much viewed as non-starters. There was an education proposal that was stalled in committee. Lawmakers brought it to the floor. It has to do with third grade reading. Talk about this. Right. It's by Senator Luann Linehan. And uh, while the headline of it is that it, she would hold back third graders from being promoted uh, if they didn't pass a proficiency test in reading, there are all sorts of exceptions, including under an amendment she has, if the parents say, no, we want the kid to advance. Real quick, two things you're looking out for next week. Well, one huge thing is the budget, and if it doesn't pass with 33 votes, then it doesn't take effect until September, so the state would be without a budget uh, as of July 1st. It could lead to a shutdown. All right. Thanks, Fred. And remember, during the legislative session, follow Fred's state government coverage each afternoon on NET Radio at 545 Central and on our website at netnebraska.org slash news. Well, parts of Nebraska got some snow last weekend, but that's nothing like the blizzard of 1888. Here's our Nebraska 150 moment. Considered one of the worst blizzards in state history, the school children's storm hit midday on January 12, 1888. Teachers, parents, and children performed acts of heroism to save others trying to get home. After the storm tore the roof off a sod school near Ord, teacher Minnie Freeman saved her 13 students by tying their hands together and leading them to a farm a half mile away. Freeman's heroics were noted across the nation in news accounts and inspired a song known by two titles, 13 were saved and Nebraska's fearless maid. With temperatures as low as 40 below, clouds of snow raged for more than 12 hours. Estimates put the death toll between 40 and 100. That's all for this edition of Speaking of Nebraska. Next week, we'll talk about the ag economy. Thanks for joining us. Good night.